I am now excited to turn it over to our colleagues at North Carolina Central University who are going to be giving us a brief history um, of Black Durham and Black Wall Street specifically. Um, I would like to ask briefly that um, they get the chance to introduce themselves. So Ms. Herbert and Dr. Johnson, would you like to just say hello to everyone and introduce yourselves before I turn it over to Jeffrey and Kiri? Be glad to do so. I'll follow uh, Colleen. Ms. Herbert? Or maybe I won't follow Colleen. <laughs> uh, let, me, <laughs> let me say uh, good morning to everyone. I uh, really enjoyed the presentation that uh, Barbara and Mamie uh, just gave on the West End and on Black Durham. There's so much great work going on. Uh, I'm Dr. Charles Johnson. I direct the public history program at North Carolina Central University. I was born and raised in, in Durham, born uh, in the Black Hospital in Durham. In fact, uh, my father is an African-American uh, physician and was is recognized by Duke University as its first African-American member of the senior medical faculty at Duke University. Uh, and he came here from Washington, D.C., from Howard University because of Lincoln Hospital and the opportunity that it afforded to African-American physicians to receive training. Um, uh, but this morning, I'm excited to introduce a couple of students that I have that are just starting out, and Jeffrey Gadsden and Kyrie Mason. I've been doing a lot of work since I returned to North Carolina Central in 2015 as fast as I can to try to help preserve um, what I think is a very unique and very special history of um, this community. And there's so many things I'd like to say, and maybe I'll get to circle back and say them, but I don't wanna take up their time. Um, but I'll ask you to bear with them. We're gonna use some technology to, to give a tour. They are first year students, uh, and I'm, I'm so happy that they agreed to do this and to get this experience. Uh, so I will, I think I saw Colleen jump, jump in, but after she has a chance to introduce herself, Jeff and Kyrie will share their presentation. Thank you. Sure. Good morning. Uh, I'm Colleen Herbert and I have the pleasure to serve as the director for the Office of Community Engagement and Service at North Carolina Central University. I was going to, I guess, introduce Kyrie and uh, Jeffrey. Um, Kyrie is a first year student, uh, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, with his uh, area of study being that of Latin American and diasporic history. And past graduation, he plans to pursue a doctorate degree. Jeffrey Gatson uh, has an interest or study for Black attorneys from the period of 1925 to 1975. And after completing his studies, he plans to attend law school. So I'm turning it over to you, Kyrie and Jeffrey. All right, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Johnson and uh, Ms. Herbert. Honestly, we can jump right into it. So um, we had already talked a little bit about Stagville Plantation, but just to give you guys a visual representation of the place, um, we'll, we'll start with this overview um, map. So looking at the Northeast here, you see this giant you know, red spot, if it looks like a wound, that's because in many ways, that's what it is, right? Um, at its peak, as we had heard, this is over 30,000 acres with over 900 people, you know, enslaved within, right? Um, and as was kind of alluded to, this is one of the first black communities in the area, if you wanna, you know, if you wanna call it that, but not in a celebratory sense, but in the sense that these are people uh, very much forced to make do with what they have available to them uh, under the conditions of slavery, right? Um, what we call Stagville Plantation, if you want to go on to the next slide, is actually the collection of three different um, properties, right? So the first section of it is the Snow Hill Plantation, which is this southern, uh, southwestern portion. Um, which has started 
in the 1750s by William Johnston. Uh, later on, um, in 1768, William Johnston invites Richard Penahan down to participate with him uh, in the establishment of his general store. Um, eventually, Richard Benahan will buy out William Johnston um, and go on to acquire the, the rest of what we call Stagville. Going on to the next slide is um, the eponymous Stagville, right? This is the land that uh, Richard Benahan buys uh, and eventually combines with the Cameron family to exert more influence over the territory, right? Um, so one of the most important things I think to talk about when we're talking about Stagville and its impact on the communities which would be formed in Durham eventually, right, is that a lot of the families and a lot of the individuals which are coming um, and not only participating in these communities, but also founding a lot of the institutions which would be important to Stagville, or well, which would be important to Durham um, and Durham's black population, right? These are people that are coming directly out of Stagville. So if you see any names such as the Amoses, the Bells, the Bryants, the Holmans, uh, the Holloways, uh, Umstead, Harrises, et cetera, right? These are all family names which are coming directly out of, uh, out of the Stagville plantation. The picture that we had actually seen in the prior presentation is actually the Holman House, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, you know, that's a direct link to, to families which still exist in Durham to this day, right? Uh, if we go into the next slide, if we go into the next slide, we see the southern plantation lands, which for the most part are underwater at this point. Um, uh, if you've ever driven north on 85, or been to Falls Lake or anything like that, right? You're driving directly over um, former plantation land, right? And this is a trend which we will get to later on when we start talking about Haytai, but this covering over of Black communities is something which has precedent here as it does in other places, right? Um, so, I mean, as you can very clearly see, this is the complete, almost, not the complete, but the almost complete covering of a place where people not only lived and worked, but also suffered and survived through the experience of, of slavery, which is in many ways a continue, which is something we'll, we'll continue to see uh, as we talk about Black Durham and its history, right? Uh, going on to the next slide, we had already talked a bit about West End, um, but another one of the communities uh, as has been, uh, I guess, alluded to is the Haytai community which is one of the most prominent black communities uh, in the state, in the country, in fact, uh, due to its large economic base, right? Um, and there are a lot of other, you know, communities throughout Durham, which are important. I would like to mention Bragtown. Uh, I would like to mention uh, Old North Durham or um, Walltown, right? Like, we talk a lot about Haytai, but never forget that there are other black communities scattered throughout the city that also have a lot of prominent figures and institutions coming out of them. But Haytai is the one which we're gonna focus on today. Um, the thing that made Haytai special, right, is its self-sustainable quality. So looking at the map here, you see this black line jetting down. Um, uh, you, yeah, you see this black line kind of jetting down the community, right? And this is, this is the old Fayetteville Street. This is the original Fayetteville Street before it was moved. Um, in the process of urban renewal in the 60s. But originally this Fayetteville Street acted as the main conduit or the main base for not only the institutions which would populate Haytai, but also as the home for a lot of those institution builders, right? So even though the map doesn't show it, if you go further down Haytai, or not further down Haytai, but further down Fayetteville Street, um, you'll see a lot of, you know, these giant kind of two-story homes, which is where these people, you know, lived and worked and, um, you know, established uh, and made this community what it, what it was, right? Uh, on Fayetteville Street, um, there were a host of businesses and educational institutions. So further down Fayetteville Street, you have North Carolina Central University. Uh, you have the site of the old Lincoln Hospital, which is now the Lincoln Community Health Center. 
you have uh, a beauty college at the northern part. Uh, you used to have a, uh, a business college as well, uh, and a host of churches, which served as anchors for the community. Um, but if you want to go on to the next slide, Jeff. Um, the thing about Haytai is, is that even though it kind of maintains its geographic shape to a certain extent, right, its character has changed over time. You can see the original, or you, yeah, you can see the original Fayetteville Street running through the center of the community, but if you look to this left portion here, you can see what Fayetteville Street is now. And as I had mentioned earlier, um, Fayetteville Street moves during this process of urban renewal, right? So originally, while Fayetteville Street was home to a host of, you know, the vital centers of the community, in the process of urban renewal, a lot of those things are shifted and moved, right? So the first process of this, of this changing, um, if you could go on to the next slide, Jeff. Okay. Um, a lot of the changes which would come are initiated by urban renewal, which gets its start with the addition of the freeway, um, which is, as you can see now, is at the northern part of the community and kind of jets through uh, the middle of it. Um, and this is a picture here of like what old Fayetteville Street used to be right on the on the right. This is what it is to the what it is now to the left. Um, you can see in this process of of changing the streets, you lose a lot of the character uh, that the community once had. So in this process of urban renewal, of adding the freeway, right, you have to disrupt the community uh, in the process of construction, but also in adding the freeway, you also have to change the main street as well, right, which is why it is as empty as it is today. And in many ways you look down the street and it, it's just a dead end, whereas before it ran directly through uh, into downtown. Um, uh, going on to the next slide, uh, this in many ways is a continuation of what we see in the covering of the southern plantation lands, right? Like this is this is the pattern which we've gotten used to at this point of of the powers that be, so to say, taking into their not really taking into consideration the community that is already there and the historic significance of the community um, that they intend to work over for their own purposes, right? Um, I'm gonna transition it over to Mr. Gadsden so he can talk to you guys a little bit about the figures and some of the specific economic institutions which came out of the Haytai community. Um, thank you very much. You're gonna have to unmute, Jeff. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, wonderful. Good morning and thank you, Kari. I am honored to be here and delighted to be speaking with you this morning. And this is an image of Paris Street in Durham. And on the right, we have a picture of Dr. John Merrick, or excuse me, John Merrick, Charles Clinton Spaulding in the middle, and Dr. Aaron McDuffie on the right. And Paris Street during the Jim Crow era was known as Black Wall Street. And Black Wall Street was a reference to the New York District's New York Stock Exchange and other prominent institutions in the nation. And in 1906, North Carolina Mutual Company, insurance company, moved its headquarters to Paris Street. And 
I just want to point out that this building here is the same as this one in the picture on the right. And so not only did they move North Carolina uh, Mutual to Paris Street, they also moved Mechanics and Farmers Bank, which is a black bank, and other real estate and textiles. And in 1912, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois came to Durham and praised the African-American entrepreneurs. And like Kyrie just said a few minutes ago, uh, in the 1960s, urban renewal wiped out much of the Haiti community. So this next slide is North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company. And again, it was the first black owned insurance agency uh, in the state and the largest in the nation. And North Carolina Mutual received its Articles of Incorporation February 28, 1899. And the institution served as a catalyst for minority <clears throat> and social economic development through jobs, investments, loans, contributions, and support for social programs. And North Carolina Mutual, um, the organizers, all of the original organizers left the first year except for American Moore. And Charles Clinton Spaulding was hired as the general manager of the company. And they moved to a two room building on East Main Street. And in 1904, the agency hired its first out of state agent and moved its headquarters to 114th Paris Street. Now in this next slide, we have the site of the old Lincoln Hospital. And Lincoln Hospital um, was founded by Dr. Aaron McDuffie Moore with assistance of members of the African American and the white community in Durham. And it was a hospital for <clears throat> African Americans and they established it in 1901. And the final location of the Lincoln Hospital was <clears throat> the location facing Fayetteville Street. And numerous black physicians, nurses, and allied professionals were able to gain much needed medical training, while African Americans across the region were able to get quality professional medical care. And this hospital was closed in 1976 when Durham County General Hospital which was an integrated hospital, uh, integrated medical facility open in Northern Durham. And Dr. Charles D. White, Watts, Dr. Charles Johnson, and others opened the Lincoln Health Center in 1971. It coexisted with the hospital until its closing and is in the approximate lo location of the former hospital today. And this next slide, we have Dr. Well, this is an overview of North Carolina Central University. And on the right, we have an older image of North Carolina Central University. And this is an image of the National Religious Training School in Chautauqua in Durham, which is now known as NCCU, North Carolina Central University. And Dr. James E. Shepard, this is the administration building here, and the name was changed in 2019 from the Hoey administration building to the James E. Shepard administration building. And he was born in Raleigh, North Carolina to Reverend Augustus and Hattie Whitted Shepard, and he attended the public schools in Raleigh. And he also attended Shaw University and received a degree in pharmacy in 1894. After getting his degree in pharmacy, he opened up a pharmacy in Durham. And in 1910, he founded the National Religious Training School in Chautauqua in Durham. And this is North Carolina Central University. It was the first 
supported liberal arts college for African American students in North Carolina. And its purpose was to develop young African American men and women into citizens with fine character and sound academic training. And in 1915, uh, the school was sold and renamed North Carolina College for Negroes. And the school graduated its first class as a four-year college in 1929 as a result of the sincere interest of Governor Agnes W. McLean and generous gifts from Durham industrialist and philanthropist Benjamin N. Duke. One minute remaining. Okay, in 1939, well, let's go into the secret game. And this is North Carolina Central University's uh, gymnasium, the McClendon McDougal Gymnasium. And in 1944, the college, uh, North, North Carolina College of Negroes played a secret basketball game against white students enrolled in middle school, school program at Duke University. And the game occurred 30 years before some teams in the ACC got their first black players. The game was played on a Sunday morning in a locked gymnasium and only the players, the referee, and the scorekeeper were allowed in the gymnasium. And that was an image to the right of the basketball players. And that's Mr. McClendon. He created the fast break and won many championships. And finally, we have the law school there. And Albert Turner was the first dean of the law school. And lastly, we have um, the history department on North Carolina Central campus right here, and it was named after Dr. Helen Edmonds, and she was the first African American woman to earn her doctoral degree from Ohio State University, and in 1938, she received her master's from the Ohio State University, and finally, she joined uh, in 1941 the faculty at North Carolina College. And she remained there until she retired in 1977. And she served as the chair of the department, dean of the graduate school, and university distinguished professor. Thank you, and everyone have a great day. OK, let me, um, if I can, just real quick say thanks, first and foremost, to, uh, to Jeffrey and to uh, Kyrie uh, for their presentation. Um, there are, there are a few things I'd like to, to kind of emphasize in there. Um, there has a, been a long-standing relationship between Duke University and North Carolina Central University. And, you know, uh, Walter Ware in writing about North Carolina Mutual, um, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, uh, talks about the, the Durham spirit and he's talking when he speaks on it. He's really talking about all of these people that Kyrie uh, and and Jeff mentioned, who are institution builders in Durham, uh, and their sense of industry and uh, ambition and so forth. But what really what really is at the, the heart of this Durham spirit was a willingness to co to collaborate. Uh, to to work literally across uh, across communities, and that is to me what as as I'm researching Black Durham, what really made it go. And there's so many ways that we could show that. But the the land, for example, that North Carolina, uh, the National Religious Training School in Chautauqua, which is today North Carolina Central University, was built on, was purchased at an extremely reasonable rate from the Duke family. The, uh, the community right across the street from it that would grow up and become this, this fabulous community of College Heights, the exact same thing that was purchased from, uh, from Brody Leonidas do. Um, and many of the institutions, it was very difficult at this time for African Americans uh, to get into politics, but they could get into business uh, if, uh, if they had the means to do so. And the, the Duke family and others gave money to help start institutions uh, and they worked together over a very long period of time and that has helped to contribute 
to uh, the development of what would become, I would say, in terms of speaking economically, the preeminent Black community in the United States for much of the 20th century. It certainly had the strongest uh, economic base for any Black community in the United States because of uh, all of these different institutions. So um, if there's something that you leave here with, it, to me, what would be really important to take away is those ties that have, have bound us across time and the short distance that's between us um, in terms of how we have worked together to make this the best possible place that we could. You know, um, I often think about, you hear about Tulsa and the Black Wall Street and Tulsa, Oklahoma, and John Hope Franklin, who had shared time at both uh, North Carolina College and at Duke University, who was arguably the preeminent African-American historian in the 20th century, uh, talked about Tulsa and, and the Black Wall Street there, but he said, man, it, was, it wasn't what was here in Durham because of all of the institutions that were here economically to support the Black community. But we saw what happened in Tulsa and in other communities like that, you know, where, um, where whites came in and destroyed those communities. There had to be, I, I can't find the document to prove it, but there had to be someone here who kept, let's say, the crazies at bay to allow the Black Wall Street to exist here in Durham on West Parish Street and so forth uh, for as long as it did. Um, so there has been this, again, uh, these long lasting ties between these two communities. Uh, I, I'd like to, to say thank you to Kimmy for inviting us to participate. And, um, you know, there's one other thing. I just have to tell you, North Carolina Central did win the secret game. The students didn't, <laughs> didn't add that, but let, let me go ahead and put that plug in. But the reality is that the real victory, I think uh, humanity won that day, right? So I think that was the bigger, the bigger victory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, as well as Kyrie and Jeff. That was just incredible to thank you for bringing really an aerial tour of Durham to all of us. It was with such a rich history. Thank you so very much. It's very hard to not be together and to do the in-person tour. So thank you for bringing that to all of us today. Um, that was very remarkable. So thank each of you.